Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, a woman of influence, Pastor Lee Jandro, teaches how Lydia was transformed by God's love. Like Lydia, women today can be world changers, influencing our families, communities, and nations. God is here to touch you. He's here to heal you, and he's here to empower you. So many think that God does it all, but what he does is he brings himself into your life to empower you for change. In the scripture in Acts 16, 13, it says, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and we began to speak to the woman who gathered there. I've been in a lot of churches around the nation. I can tell you that sometimes it seems like women aren't noticed. But I'm here to notice you today. I'm here to tell you a story about a woman whose life changed everything in lives. And these women were gathered together. Women gather together differently than men do. They gather together, and this is where um, that Luke writes that they were found. They were found by the side of the river. There is a river of God that flows through you. It says, out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. And in that river, God is doing something mighty in your life. And so they were by the river. And, it, and, and he continues on in verse 14. It says, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. One of the greatest things that I tell people is people are seeking out spirituality. Are you going to be the one that opens the door to them? See, we talk about evangelism, we talk about sharing the good news, and we talk about all those things. But sometimes we want someone else to do it. But as these women were gathered by the river, what we see, we see that her heart was open to what God was doing. So I pray that each one of you, whether you be in the room who have been praying for family members or watching on on the live stream here, I pray that the hearts around you would be open to the words of life that you carry because God wants you to be a dealer of hope in the people around you. He wants you to develop that, that understanding that love never fails. He wants you to reveal that God's grace is amazing. And he continues on in verse 15, and it says, When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited them up to her home. She said, If you consider me a believer in the Lord, please come and stay at my home. And she persuaded us. I think one of the greatest changes in the hour that I've I've been watching is people are starting to realize the power of opening their home. There's been, a, there's been something that's gone on where people have kind of sanitized what the gospel is. Where I live, I live in Keene, New Hampshire. Uh, my fellowship gathers in a hall. In that hall, we are in the center of our community. There's 25,000 people. We probably have a, a couple to 300 homeless people. Many of them come in, if no more than just to get coffee and go outside. But it is a gathering place. And what has happened, though, so many times is people give money to our ministry for the homeless. And I said to a friend of mine, if I had one thing that I would love to see, I would begin, I would like to take the people who gather with us, and I would like to take them out onto the streets with us, not to be a witness in that sense, but just to see the living conditions that some of the people where we live endure. And so the invitation into their homes. When my wife and I met and we married 33 years ago, we knew from the beginning that God was in the midst of what we were doing. And we had his and her children. We both had been married before. Both had gone through terrible times and saw the restoration of the Lord. So hold on to the promise of restoration, whatever it is in your life that you seek. And we made the decision that our house was going to be a place where people could come. We had a fairly large house. She had two children. I had three children. We had the his and hers, no ours. And then God began to bring men and women who were broken in their spirit. At one point, we had three men who had come out of prison. They lived with us. People said, how can you have ex-cons live with you? I said, everybody has a past. Everybody has a history. And if someone's going to hold my history against me, they may not be able to walk into my future. 
So if someone's holding the, their, your past against you, I break that off of your life this morning. I declare that you have been made free and freedom has been given to you. And your past, like Paul talks about in the book of Revelation, is like written on a white rock in the heavenlies. You are a different person, a new creation, it tells us in the book of Corinthians. Once you were this, but now you were this. And what this is, is powerful. And so, continues on and it says, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Women, you are persuaders. You have the ability to persuade, not through manipulation and guile, but there is something in you that has the ability to bring persuasion into the house. You are oftentimes the one that others meet before they ever walk through the door of a church building. And you need to know and rest in the power of the Lord in that. Because he's doing something mighty. He's not just doing it in your families, but he's doing it that in the people that live around you. And so Lydia, she was a powerful woman of faith. Women, I just declare that you are powerful women of faith. Powerful women of faith. Faith is not like the, the muscle kind of thing, but you have been given the gift of faith and the utilization of that to see people's lives changed. Perhaps it's your children. Perhaps it's a spouse. Perhaps it's a family member that's from afar. But you're calling them in. And I, like the, pro, the, the, the father of the prodigal, every day I tell my wife, I go wait to see who God's bringing. Because he is truly bringing in the prodigals. But sometimes we have to open our eyes to the truth that God is doing. So she was a powerful woman of faith. And she was a businesswoman. So many women have been pushed aside in business. I'm in business. If you saw my vehicle outside, that's one of my companies. You know, I believe positive news for you. It's not just a gospel thing. It's a reality thing. There are great things that are happening in our nation. And I remind people of those things that are happening. But people in business oftentimes get to touch people that no one else touches. So if you're in business, I commend you. And if you're not in business and you're thinking about it, maybe it's time to investigate that with wise counsel. And begin to look at what can be changed in lives. Clearly, Lydia was a, was a woman of influence in her community and in her household. You, begin, you, you need to begin to see yourself as a person of influence. You have the gospel. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the big one. He is the one that empowers you to bring change into your families. For those of you who are watching from home, even now you're, you're catching something, you're hearing something, you're looking around the room. Maybe it's pictures on the wall of family members. You know, maybe you're scrolling through your phone right now and this is catching you because you just saw someone who you know really needs to know the love of the Lord. We pray for those people that you're looking at right now and we declare that they're coming into the kingdom because the kingdom is not full. The kingdom is waiting. The kingdom awaits those that have not known the truth to find their identity in, in, in Christ. There has been so much identity crisis in our nation. And you know, I'm talking about in the natural, but then we see the identity theft where someone is well-meaning and godly and good. And all of a sudden it just seems they would veer off the path. We're calling those people back into the pathway of the Lord. And so the Apostle Paul and his companions, they traveled to Philippi, and they went outside the city gate, as they said, to the river, where they expected to find a place of prayer. I'm telling you, women, and I'm telling you beyond a shadow of a doubt, I, my wife is a prayer warrior. If it doesn't look good, she's going to make it good. She'll be on her knees, laying on her bed, doing whatever it takes I joke with her, I go, that's how you got me, babe. You prayed that a godly man would look into your life. You had all these conditions, and I came in, and I didn't look anything like that except for the conditions. I had long hair. That wasn't what you were looking for. But I was a drummer, and that worked. So I say that kind of in jest, but there's a gathering of ladies who are beginning to pray together. And just like it was in the early church, it's happening in this church. And it's happening in the church at large, the church of the community. And, and so Lydia was this touch point. 
And I, and I say that, that God is going to use many of you as a touch point. We used to say in my early days of uh, Bible school, we used to say that, you know, you may be the only Jesus that anyone ever sees. You may be the only Jesus that anyone ever sees. Well, well, Jesus was a man, neither male nor female, all made in his image for the glory of God. And I encourage you to begin to pray because sometimes we, we weaken in our prayers. We don't think it's happening. We don't think it's enough. Pastor Peter was sharing about the meeting we had on Friday night. I understand from those pictures that that was the largest gathering that had been in this house in all those years. That meeting happened because of prayer. That meeting happened because of prayer, not because I showed up. I came in response to the Lord. It happened because people prayed. It's easy with everything that goes on in church congregations and everything we read about in the world, the economy and the this and the that. You know, I, I shared earlier my testimony and I shared my, about my grandson who's here and how his mom was a single mom and how she gave him up for adoption. And after 28 days on Mother's Day, 16 years ago, she came to me and said, Dad, I can't go through with the adoption. And my wife and her went to claim my, my grandson. And he lives with me. He spends any, on a given week anywhere from five to seven days a week because I do school with him. Because with COVID and all that that happened, school is just weird for kids. And the only way we're going to help kids is to be part of their life. The Bible doesn't say that it's a chosen generation's. It says it is a chosen generation. When I look around the room, from the oldest to the youngest, I see not generations, but I see a generation. A generation that is going to change the world. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Priests prayed. And so... It's easy to get caught up in the weeds. It's easy to open Facebook or social media and go, oh, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. And, and sometimes it is. You know, one of my friends said to me, he goes, do you care what happens in Washington, D.C.? No, I care what happens in the community I live in. I care what goes on in my household. When we used to bring these men in, that were ex-cons and, and people like that, and they began to work for us. They learned the ways of the Lord. Every single man that ever stayed with us over that four-year period, and there were many, every single one of them but one went into ministry. We need people to walk with people. And so, like I say, it's easy to get caught up in the weeds. I understand but, but God is clearing the way. He tells us that his light is a lamp unto our feet. A lighting of our pathway to walk with him. You know, Pastor Peter mentioned that I was, I was a prophetic voice. I operate in the prophetic grace. I'm excited about that. But sometimes I have to come to this place that while that's way out there, today's the day. You are the most important people on the live stream who are watching in this house. You are important because you're here. Not that other people aren't important, but you're the only people I see right now in this moment. I'm not looking at the past. I'm not looking at the future. I'm not trying. I am being. And I encourage you that the being is a powerful mode. So Lydia was a Gentile. That was weird for people. Right? If you read through the scriptures and you find out she was a Gentile. But then it goes on to tell you that she became a worshiper of God. And she listened to Paul as he shared the message with the women. He shared the gospel. He didn't share all the rules and the regulations and everything. He said, here, I want to share the good news with you. I want to share the nearly too good to be believed news that Christ died, that you might have life. That you might have life in this 
time and this season. We read through the scriptures and we see Jesus had all these encounters. I shared this the other night with somebody. You know, we, we, we see these women that came to Jesus. You know, when Jesus needed money, all of a sudden there was these households. But you see, female, you see females written up as the suppliers of the finance. And then when, when he needed to announce you know, the value of what he stood for and everything, a woman came over and she broke open a vial. She broke open a container and she began to anoint his feet with her hair and with her tears. And, and she put this bomb and, and, and Judas looked at it. He said, that's too valuable because he didn't see the value of Christ at that time. You are bringing value to Christ. Every time you smile at the cashier in the store, despite their worst efforts to irritate you, God is doing something through you. And so she listened as Paul shared the message of the too good to be believed message. And the Lord opened her heart to receive her message, his message about um, Jesus, and that was found in Acts 16, 14. And then she continued on, and, and her and her families were baptized. You know, sometimes we don't see baptizes as powerful it is, but across the nations, baptizing, you know, people can get saved, but when they get baptized, things begin to change for them. And, and things begin to change, and she recognized that there was a change that had happened in her life because of the message and the opening of her heart, and she received that baptism. And then she turned around and she said to Paul, she said, I would like you to stay with me. See, when you have something good, and you do, because Christ in you is the hope of glory, when you have something good in your life, people want to embrace it. People will walk by and, 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 and they will look at you and they will look at you and they will come to you. The other day I was down here and we were walking and we encountered, we, we encountered some people and I just began to smile at people and somebody came up to me and said, I don't know what it is about you, but you're different. And I said, yeah, everybody says that. I kidded around a little bit. I know what I carry. I want you to recognize what you carry. You don't carry a little baby Jesus. Little children don't carry a half pint Jesus. They carry the full measure of who Christ is. Christ doesn't come in bite-sized pieces. He comes in all his glory through your life. And so I want you to just take a moment and take a deep breath. And I just want you to breathe in. And I want you to say, God, touch me afresh. And if you don't know God, and you don't know Jesus, but somehow you're watching this on camera, maybe with a relative or a friend, I want you to know that God is coming to you in a mighty way. I shared my testimony a little while ago about how Jesus walked up to me in a grocery store. I was not looking for Jesus. I was looking for chicken soup. I had an encounter in the middle of a grocery store, and God changed my life. I ended up giving my life over to Lord at aisle two at the cash register with two friends of mine who were Christians. As I walked down the hall, the Lord began to change my whole life. I came back from that. I went to. I ended up going to a church fellowship that night on a Thursday. Who has church on Thursday? I'm kidding. But I didn't know that. Sunday morning, one hour, that's what I knew. And I went into that church fellowship, and as I sit there, I they started moving chairs away and everything, and I gathered on the side of the building, and I leaned up against the wall, and I knew this guy was praying in tongues, and he was getting obnoxiously loud next to me as he prayed in tongues, and I opened my eyes to tell him to lower the volume, and it turned out to be me who was praying in tongues. God does need you to open your heart, but when you open your heart, you never know how it'll arrive. People say, well, didn't you pray a prayer? No, I didn't pray a prayer at all. I honestly didn't. I don't, I don't know what I did. I, I was like, Campbell's chicken soup, Jesus. I share that with you because God operates outside of all our boxes sometimes. People say, oh, I wish that would happen to my friend. I wasn't looking for it. Maybe people prayed that that would happen. Some of you met my brother the other night. He, he became a believer long before I did. He, everything he told me about God, I didn't want. I'll just tell you that. But when Jesus showed up next to me and began to talk to me, my world was changed. 
So if you're at home, God wants to encounter you. He wants to encounter you as much as you might want to encounter him. And he might want to encounter you even in a greater realm. And so, you know, I, I, as I thought about this yesterday, I was thinking that, you know, some of the lessons I got out of Lydia's life was that she was most likely a mom because it says that members of her household were baptized. And we know that she had great influence in her family. Moms have some of the greatest influence in their family of anyone. I know dads are there, and I don't mean this in a negative way. But while I was out working, my wife was there instructing. She was the one taking the time with children. And, and Lydia had this great faith, and she had tons of enthusiasm. And I want to tell you, do not be ashamed or afraid of living out your life with God in front of your children. See, that's a big word, because I know lots of parents are like, well, I don't want to influence where my kid's going. I'm not sure how to do that. I'm going to tell you that more is caught than taught sometimes. The times that I spend, as I mentioned, my grandson's with me. He spends much of his life with me. He, he's traveling with me now and, and, and things like that. He's a great kid. I don't sit there and go, you need to do A, B, C, D, and F. There's an E in there, I know. But I don't do it that way because what I do is I want to model it for him. Let your faith be manifest in front of your family. Some people go off and they read their Bible in the corner and, and, and they want the children to play or whatever the deal is. But I think it's important that you do the things in front of your children on some level. Otherwise, they wake up one day and they go, well, I don't know what that's all about. And they need to know what that's all about because it's important. It's Mother's Day. And Mother's Day is oftentimes some of the most pain and the painful. And I'm here to tell you, I was that child that I pained my mom. I pained her a lot. And when she passed away in 2001, three days before, uh, after 9-11, she was, she was in a bed. She, we never even told her that 9-11 had happened. And with the passing of my mom, all of a sudden my brothers, my sister came to us, came to me, and they said, you know, you are the oldest in the family. You need to lead the way. And I look at that, and I look at the pain that I've seen in the places that I've been, and I want to be the answer to that. But God needs each one of us to be the answer to that. I fully understand sometimes how painful life can be. Prayed for a woman the other night and and I and I came to her she I ended up seeing her after the meeting. And I told her I yesterday I said God wants you to have a voice. You're really good at all the things you do but God wants to restore your voice cuz the world needs the gentle side that motherhood represents in our culture. And we need to see that come forth in special ways. And so Lydia's faith it, and her enthusiasm for the kingdom brought her forward, and she began to powerfully impact her family. The impact was seen, as we read through the rest of the, the few scriptures after that, that things change because of her salvation, because of her embracing the word of the Lord. And so we see that happen. And we saw her as a generous person. And we saw her as hospitable. You know, as, as Peter was receiving the, Pastor Peter was receiving the offering, and he mentioned something about single moms. My wife was a single mom when I met her. And she understood the power of giving. And it was really, really tough. She shared a story with me one time how she took, she felt that she was to take the last few dollars that she had and put it in an offering. And she took all that she had. And someone came up to her at the end of the service and gave her her money for rent. God loves people. He's no respecter of persons, but when I see single moms, 
I want you to know my heart goes out to you. Because God has a plan for you. He has a plan to cause you to be an influence and a changer. My, my grandson, he, he's not really been involved with his own father. And my, my oldest grandson, he's never met his father. We need dads, but moms, we need you. We need you. And I want you to, and, I, and I'm, and I'm going to come into this place. Be confident, not in yourself, but in the God you trust. Be confident. Somebody said to me, and even my wife would tell you this, she, she gets nervous because I trust everybody. Well, Lee, you're not a discerner of spirits. Oh, I am. I am. But I trust everybody because everybody has a past, even if it was a minute ago. And she asked me, and some people asked me in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, how come you trust everybody? And I said, because I trust him. And if he's not in it, I'm not in it. So if I can trust him, then I can trust you. So I want you to become confident in the Lord. I want you to know that he's for you and not against you, that he has nothing but love towards you. And so Lydia trusted in her conversion even, you know, she trusted that God was real. God has the ability to supernaturally show you, even if you're looking at a can of chicken soup, that he's real. He has the ability to reveal himself to you. He revealed himself to Lydia. He showed her that he was able to do all that he said he would do. And that because she could trust in him and began to trust in him, she could open her home to these men. She could open her home and be benevolent. She could open her home and be a giver. You know, one of the things, you know, I, I, I say this a lot. I work with a lot of young people. My grandson's 16. And people have a lot to say, oftentimes negative, about his age group. But I will tell you, he is one of the most pastoral people that I hang out. He hasn't had to go through my stuff. I made a decision a long time ago that my ceiling would be his floor. And as long as he stands on that floor, he has the security of the God I trust. Not that he does not have to develop his own trust in God, but his generation has already begun to outgive a millennial generation. And the millennial generation already gave, outgave my generation. Outgave. They understand this. They may not do it the way we do it, but we need to see that while they're vulnerable, they're giving. And Lydia became a giver. And she was confident that she could help others. So as I close this and give this back to Pastor Peter, I just want to take a moment and pray. For each one of you in this room, for each one of you watching, this morning, God has a word for you. He's calling you up into faith. He's calling you to be influential in the community and in your homes. So today is a new day. Everybody says it's a new day, and it is. This is truly the day that the Lord has made. He knew you would be listening. He knew you would be in the room, and he knew I would be here praying for you this morning that God would do a great and mighty work in your life. So, Lord, we just invoke your name, Jesus, and we declare your name, Jesus, over the people in this room, over the people that are watching, and for those that are, would be coming in. Father, bring blessing great and mighty blessing into the lives of the people all around this great nation and nations today that we might see a revived heart and women coming into a place where they recognize that they're influential because of their confidence in who you are. God bless you. We pray that as you have listened, this message has been a blessing to you and God has opened your eyes to see more about how much God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. If you just receive Jesus as your Savior, write to me and let me know what God has done for you. God bless you and fill you with living hope. 
We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as $1 a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations to Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.